verse 24 and 25. Jude chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and, and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Let us have a prayer, please. Father God in heaven, we come to you this morning thanking you most of all, Father, for your son Jesus and for that great sacrifice that he, that he gave to each and every one of us, Father, Amen. shedding his blood that we all may have the hopes of eternal life with you. And we pray, Father, that you will we thank you for this great, wonderful day that we're able to gather here, Father, and study a portion of your word and sing songs and praises to you. And pray that you will be with Brother Gary as he leads our minds and hearts in song. And pray that you will be with Brother Donald as he gives us a lesson this morning, Father, that our minds may be uh, reflect on that time and that uh, we can take his lesson to heart, Father. Pray that you will. Be with those of our number who are on the sick list, those, Father, who are sick and those who are having procedures done. Pray that you will bless those hands that minister to them and pray that you will be with Deidre as she has her procedure done this week, Father, and pray that everything turns out well. Pray, Father, that you will nurse them back to their much-desired health. Pray that you will be with those who are out traveling. Pray that you will bring them home, bring them, return them here safely, and pray that you will be with those who have fallen away, Father. Pray that you will be with them, pray that they can turn their lives back over to you. And we pray also, Father, for the missionaries of this world who are over in foreign countries. Pray that you will be with them and their families. Pray that you will watch over them, let them be safe while they're spreading your word. Pray, Father, that you will give them the needs that that only you know that they need and pray father that you will be with us throughout this hour throughout this day forgive us of our sins it's in your son's name that we pray amen Prepare mind for the Lord's Supper. Go to 382. 382. Why did my Savior come to earth?
morning I'll be reading a passage from Matthew 26, verses 26 to 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new in my Father's kingdom. Heavenly Father, thank you for this bread which represents your son's body that was hung on that cruel cross for us. And we thank you for this great sacrifice. And as we partake, we pray that we go back and reflect on that moment of his death on the cross and what it means to us as Christians. And we do so in a manner well-pleasing to you, Lord. And just name pray. Amen. Bow again, please. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for the sacrifice that was made on that cross. And Lord, as we partake of this cup, which represents the blood that he shed, we pray that we'll do it in a manner pleasing unto thee. For it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. If you would, now please turn to 190. We'll sing one verse of this before we have the opportunity to give back unto God what we have been blessed with. Oh, Jesus, my Savior, with thee I am blessed. My life and salvation, my joy and my rest. Thy name be my theme and my love be my soul. Thy grace shall The Lord's Supper has been concluded. Now we're given the opportunity to give as we've been commanded in 1 Corinthians 16, chapter, verses 1 and 2. Would you bow with me, please? Holy God and Father, we're so thankful for the prosperity we enjoy. We thank you for all your wondrous blessings, and we pray as we give now that we're given away out of joyful hearts that demonstrates our love, our reverence for you, and a desire to help the cause of Christ. We pray the blessings upon the funds that are given that to be used in a wise way. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Seven nine four. After singing this song, I would ask you to stand for the, the prayer. We'll sing it slower than. Unto the
Our holy God and our Father in heaven, we indeed do praise you, God. We praise you as our, not only our creator, but one who sustains and keeps us and watch over us that through your providential care. We're thankful, Father, for your great grace that you mercifully looked down upon us as sinners and was willing to give us your Son. Out of your love and his love, he died on the cross for our sins. We may have redemption. We thank you for every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that are now ours in Christ. We thank you for the hope of eternal life and victory over death. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being able to walk in the way of righteousness as we're guided by the teachings of your word. And we thank you for that precious word, the word that makes us aware of you, of your glory, how we can be saved, how we can live a life that is uh, truly pleasing to you with hope. Father, we thank you for the fact that you're always near, that we can cast our cares upon you knowing that you care for us. So we're thankful for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for the nation which we live, Father, the prosperity and the opportunity to care for our families, the freedom of religion that we've had. We're thankful for that, and we pray, Father, that you will bless our nation and will continue to hold to those, that you will be with our leaders, that they will enact the law and authority in a way that preserves that freedom, that allows us to continue to live as Christians and to preach your word and encourage righteousness within our nation. And Father, we're thankful that we can come together this on the Lord's day. To come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to embrace each other in fellowship and be a source of exhortation and as we worship together in our, we're blending our voices in praise to you. We thank you for the visitors we have with us for they've come to be a, a part of this assembly. We pray you'll things that we're encouraging to them. And Father, we pray as we participate in these acts of worship that we may truly recognize it's an opportunity to glorify you, an opportunity to express our love, our reverence, and our thanksgiving, and to engage our heart in that way. We pray, Father, your blessings upon a number of our congregation who are suffering illness and afflictions of some sort. We pray you be with them, comfort them, strengthen them, help them to retain their hope and recognition that you are with them even in times of difficulty. And bless us, Father, that we also may reach out unto them to be a source of comfort and a source of help. We pray you now, Father, as we continue in this worship that you will be with us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Five eight seven five hundred and eighty seven will be the song we sing, but mark your hymnal to four seven zero, the song of encouragement, victory in Jesus four hundred and seventy. Mark that. We'll sing five eighty seven now. If the skies above you are gray, you are getting so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray, all the whole day through, there's a silver light that shines in a heavenly land. Look by faith and see, my friend, trust in his promises, friend.
and reach into your bulletin and you will find the outline for our uh, lesson this morning practicing your daily religion practicing your daily religion Chuck would you give me just a little bit more what we do Daily as a Christian matters. The decisions that we make, the plans that we seek to fulfill, all of those things have an impact on our relationship with God. And so it matters that it matters what those things are that fill our day. Now, we've got responsibilities. We have work. We have family obligations. We have things that we need to do. But where does God fit into the grand scheme of things? When I step back and I look at my relationship with God, what part does he play in my daily life? I want to talk this morning about what it means to be a daily Christian, about the sacrifices that we have to make, about the goals that we as a people of faith should not only be setting, but goals that we should be meeting and, and reaching. And I want to do that by looking at five, uh, six things uh, this morning, and we'll get into those in a moment. But first, I want to look at some examples of what I call daily religion. The first one is the Apostle Paul and how Paul saw his daily religion. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 31, he says, I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Now, does that sound like he's wrestling at whether or not to have a commitment to God? Does that sound like Paul is saying that I'm going to waver between God and the world, that I'm going to struggle to choose what I believe is right and good and godly? Uh, Paul has the, 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 the will for all. He has the, the desire. Um, he has the want to, to, see a, to be a person who says, you know, I die daily for the cause of Christ. Do we? Do we have that type of commitment and sacrifice? We go on and we see in the life of Peter and the apostles in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29 where it says we ought to obey man rather we ought to obey God rather than man. It's God who should have priority in our life. It's God who we should uh, obey. It's God who should be the one that we say what would he have me do? How would he have me live and am I doing it? I ought to obey God before I obey man. And then one final example is Timothy. And Timothy, in his daily religion, 1 Timothy chapter 6, I give you verse 12 on your outline, back up just one to verse 11. 
Paul says to Timothy, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession and the presence of many witnesses. Look at the type of person that, that, that Timothy is called to be on a daily basis. A man of righteousness, a man of godliness, of faith and love, of patience and gentleness. All of those things are important. All of them are qualities and attributes that are going to strengthen his relationship with God. All of those are things that require a daily religion, a daily commitment. Let me give you some examples for us when it comes to our daily religion. Here's the first one. We need to practice daily our cross-bearing. Making those sacrifices that might need to be made, enduring those things that might need to be endured. Go over to Luke chapter 9, the Gospel of Luke chapter 9, and notice these words beginning in verse uh, 23, Luke chapter 9. In verse 23, then he said, Jesus is the one who's speaking. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, you want to follow me? You want to walk in my steps? You want to be a disciple? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Bear those daily burdens. Be an individual who's willing to say, even though it may cost me greatly, and it does at times, even though there may be those things that I have to struggle through, those things that seem to be at times overwhelming to me, because I understand that I'm called to be a follower of Christ, a, disciples of Christ, a disciple of Christ, I understand that there's times when on a daily basis I have to pick up that cross. I have to do all that I can to be a person of faithfulness. I give you a quote there on your outline. I don't know who said it. I'd give them credit if I did. But they said Christianity isn't for the timid. I think they're absolutely right. Christianity is for those who are willing to take up their cross and follow Christ. Here's a second thing. We should practice daily prayer. Go over, I want you to notice what Jesus said. You're in the Gospel of Luke. Turn backward to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. And notice beginning in verse 5, I want to highlight three key things that Jesus says. Here's the first one. He says, and when you pray, go on down to verse 6. He says, but when you pray, and go down one more to verse 7, and he says again, and when you pray. He says it three times, not if you pray, not maybe if the time comes and you can get around to it, or you can, I know you're busy, I understand you've got all these things, but if you can find just a moment, go ahead and pray, if you will. The, the encouragement from Jesus is that we be a people of prayer, that we make the effort. How can we not do that daily? How can we not be individuals who say, it matters to me if I go into the presence of God and pray to him. It matters to me if I have that communication with God. If I'm able to go into his presence and say, here's what's going on. This is what's happening. Forgive me for this. Help me in that. It needs to be something that we do on a daily basis. Jesus says one is expected to pray. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 17, the Apostle Paul says, pray without ceasing. Some of you have it where it just says two words, pray continually. Doesn't that sound daily? Doesn't that sound like a commitment that we're supposed to make? Am I committed to being a person of daily prayer? Am I committed to being a daily Christian? Am I committed to doing those things, those attributes, those qualities that should manifest in me the belief that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ? How can we say we follow him but not pray? How can we say we accept him as our Lord and Savior, but we don't pray to God? How is that possible for us as a people of faith. Here's the third thing. We need to practice 
daily Bible study. Practice daily Bible study. Go over to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And notice verse 11. Paul's gone down and he's dealing with some individuals. And he says this. It says this about them. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, the, the individuals who are being mentioned, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. We've heard what you said, Paul. We understand that you're taking us back to the scriptures, but we want to see it. We, we want to see that it's there. We want to come and study the scriptures on that daily basis so that we can make sure that what is being said is in accordance with what the word of God says. That's a good thing for each and every one of us to do. To be the type of people who say on a daily basis, I need to study the word of God. Do you? I think it goes along with being a people of of prayer. I'm not saying we don't have things to do. I'm not saying there aren't important things, but do we make time for Bible study? Do we make time to focus on scripture and listen to God talking to us? Go over to Hebrews chapter 5. You're in Acts, turn forward in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 5 and beginning in verse 12. The Hebrew writer is, is talking to those who are thinking about leaving Christianity and going back to the law. And they're wavering between that decision, which one is the best for them. And in the midst of that, I think he hits the nail on the head, the author of Hebrews, when he begins to say what could be causing them to waver, what some of that problem could be. And it's a lack of Bible study. And the author says these words. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. There's clearly, I'll give you verse 13, but there's clearly a lack of growth. There's clearly the understanding that, that these individuals should be in a better place than what they are. They should have a better knowledge than what they do. And he goes on and he says, for everyone who partakes only of milk, that's them, is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food, this is where they need to be, belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Your problem is, you're not studying the scriptures. Your problem is you need to be in a certain place in your relationship with God that you're not in. Now, if that was true for them, a lack of study caused them to struggle, why wouldn't that be true for us? If it was true that the author of Hebrews says, listen, you need to move from that milk and you need to be able to chew on that solid food, if that was true for them, wouldn't it be true for us? We need to be a people who in practicing our daily religion are ones who are willing to say, have I gone to the word? Have I studied the word? Have I immersed myself in the word? Am I growing in the word? Am I being instructed by the word? Am I being rebuked by the word? How is the word having an influence in my life? Not just once so often, but daily, each and every day. Am I a student of the word of God? Here's number four. We need to practice daily forgiveness. Go over. You're in Hebrews. Turn backward to the first book in your Bible. Go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. And beginning in verse 14. Jesus is the one who's speaking. So I think he's going to get this right. And he says this. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I don't know of anybody who has a problem with verse 14. It's great. It, it, it's simple. Um, I come to verse 14, and I don't need to go get a commentary. 
I don't need to call somebody up and say, man, I'm really wrestling with what verse 14. We get it. And we like it. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. Here's the struggle. Verse 15. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. There's where the difficulty comes in in which Jesus is saying that forgiveness matters. That when it comes to my relationship with those around me, that it matters whether or not I have a forgiving spirit towards them. Now, I've said this before. That doesn't mean that what they did was right. You're not hearing that from this pulpit. That doesn't mean that what they did is okay. I'm not saying that. But it does mean that in our relationship with those around us, that it matters whether or not we are a people of forgiveness, that we are a people who are willing to understand that my forgiveness of others has an effect on God's forgiveness with me. It's where the the rubber meets the road. It's where the application comes to us that we can't deny. I say this on your outline. What is the motivation behind our refusal to not forgive? Why not do it? Well, we might be hurt, be angry, frustrated. We could have more nefarious things. I just, I want them to suffer. I don't want them to feel any type of relief for what they've done to me. I want them to feel the full force of it. What are the reasons behind us not being a people of daily forgiveness? Can we justify those reasons in the presence of God? Can we be a people who stand before him and say, here's why I'm not doing it. Can we do that without God saying, listen, here's where you went wrong. Here's where you stumbled. It came down to your daily life, your daily commitment. We need to be a people of forgiveness. Here's number five. We need to practice daily thankfulness. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We looked at verse 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And notice verse 18. Paul says, In everything give thanks. Then he gives you a little bit of commentary on it. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Thankfulness matters. That we are a people of thankfulness matters. That we are a people of gratitude matters. That we are individuals who are familiar with going into the presence of God and saying, thank you for the things that you've done. Thank you for the blessings that you've given me. Thank you for where I am now and the things that I can do. Doesn't mean every need is met. Doesn't mean we have absolutely everything. But it does mean that we are people who recognize that God has blessed us. And in blessing us, are we a people of thankfulness? Not just occasionally, we're talking about a daily religion. We're talking about what shapes us each and every day as a people of faith. Those things that make up the totality of who we are. Is part of that me being a person of thankfulness? I'll give you one more. We need to practice our daily cross-bearing. We need to practice daily prayer, practice daily Bible study, practice daily forgiveness, practice daily thankfulness, and finally, practice daily confession. Go over to 1 John chapter 1, not the Gospel of John. Go to 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. Notice what John says. I always... When I read these couple of verses here, I always refer to them as John's theology because it gives us an understanding into how John understands um, the whole idea of being a person that confesses their sin. And, And John, in just a few words, talks about how deep his theology is. And he says this, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We're not even being honest with who we are. We're not even being honest as a person of faith. He says, if we confess our sins, which is the opposite of verse 8, 
If we confess our sins, he, that's God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse nine, verse eight has no blessing. Verse nine is all blessing. Verse eight says there's a problem. There's an issue at hand. Verse nine says, listen, there's a good resolution to this. Verse eight is I have a problem with sin. Verse nine is I know who to take that sin to. If we confess our sins. And then verse 10 says this. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. It goes one step further than verse 8. In verse 8, it affects us as a people not confessing our sins. In verse 10, it affects our relationship with God in not confessing our sins. In verse 8, I deceive myself. In verse 9, I'm hurting my relationship with God. I mean, in verse 10, I'm hurting my relationship with with God. You see the progression? I don't confess if I do confess and the need to confess. It's important for us to be a people who practice that on a daily basis, who are familiar with going into the presence of God and saying, it's me, Lord. I did it. I, I don't need to look around for the guilty person. I, I can tell you that I'm the one who's done the sin, who's committed the act, who's given myself over to that thing that I know you said that I shouldn't do. It's all about me because I did it. We need to be a people who do that on a daily basis. A people who go into the presence of God and are honest with our faults and our failures. You know, it, it's, it's hard at times. And, and, and David, David said it this way. David said in the Psalms, he said, when I kept silent, my bones grew old. Um, when I didn't confess his sin, I became bitter. I became brittle. It harmed my relationship. But then he says, when I confessed my sin, things changed. I think the same thing is true for us on a daily basis. If we confess our sins, it brings us that renewal. If we confess our sins, it helps us to be a people who have life in us. And we do that on a daily basis. Well, let me ask you, do you practice a daily religion? I'm, I'm not saying, do you practice religion? I'm saying, do you practice a daily religion? That each and every day, your relationship with God matters. And you produce within it those qualities that are important to strengthen your relationship with God. Is that you? Well, I hope so. Let me extend to you the invitation this morning. If you're here and you're in need of prayer, we'd love to pray with you, encourage you. If you're here and you're not a member of the Lord's church, friend, I extend to you the gospel plan of salvation to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. And if you haven't done that, we encourage you to make that commitment. If you need to study more about it, we'll study with you. If you have questions about it, we'll answer those questions. If you're subject to the invitation, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing. I heard an old, old story of the Savior come.
23, our God is alive, and then we'll have a closing prayer. There is beyond the answer blue, a God consumed from human side. He can the shadow with every hue and bring the world with his great mind. There is a God. There is a God. God in heaven, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the blessings of life. Thank you, Father, that we have this privilege that we can assemble without being prayed or molested or harmed. Father, continue to love us, be with us, and Father, we pray for this congregation and each member those that are upon a bed of affliction, Father, will you extend your hand of mercy to them? Give them the opportunity to attend once more. We pray that you'll be with us as we depart this building. Continue to bless us, love us, go with us. In Christ's holy name, 